This program is a presentation of UCTV for educational and non-commercial use only. In this episode of Northgate News, we'll stop and look at how our world is changing. From India's prized mangoes that are finally available in the States, to a new proposal offering the promise of Greek citizenship for some immigrants. We'll also examine the rising trend of open carry, the birth of the Tea Party, and discover an artist whose sculptures harness the power of the sun. Two years ago, the Supreme Court overturned Washington, D.C.'s gun ban. The court is now poised to extend that ruling to state governments, and gun activists are coming together to flaunt their right to bear arms. It was a sunny Friday afternoon in Berkeley, California, and I was about to strap two magazines and a Glock 9mm handgun to opposite sides of my belt. So, like, is that correct? And that's it. Brad Huffman, a certified firearms instructor, had lent me a gun, ammunition, and a holster for the day. Just make sure that your shirt's anchored in if you want to tuck it in a bit right there because we can't cover at all. That's because carrying a concealed gun without a permit is illegal in California. Check and make sure it's not loaded. As soon as I've inspected, make sure it's But not wearing it in plain view, unloaded, or open carrying is allowed. We'll check this one here. Okay. Verify that it's also not loaded. Okay. We're just going to drop it straight in the holster. The gun felt awkward and heavy on my hip, but for Brad, it was natural. He's been open carrying for a year and a half, hoping to show folks on both sides of the gun debate that it's lawful. It is a right, and people need to realize that just because you disagree with something doesn't mean it's going to go away. And what I want is just commonplace, where it's something that people don't even care about. It's just something that's so common every day in an everyday activity that nobody gives a second look. Brad has helped organize events across the Bay Area to raise awareness of open carry, like this barbecue in Vallejo that drew 150 people. Open carry is a growing movement in California. There have been over 150 meetups, big and small, in the Bay Area alone. We got some flyers here for you, and there's a donation box for the kids after school program for Vallejo. If you want Everyone who comes has their own reasons for open carrying. Yeah, it takes me two seconds to go from unloaded to loaded. And, uh, and that's for my protection and the protection of my neighbors. For many, though, open carry is not so much about self-defense as it is about making a statement. I'm not trying to overthrow the government. <laughs> I mean, I just, I'm just concerned about individual rights and, uh, and the lack or the slow erosion of those rights. Many open carry advocates describe themselves as libertarian, but the movement is careful not to align itself with a political ideology. I like coming together with people that you know, enjoy the same things I do, which is firearms. The majority of people in the movement are, you know, avid shooters. You know, we learn from each other's experiences. And it's easier to do when you have more people versus as an individual. Their medium is the places that people, especially younger people, hang out. Robert Weisberg teaches criminal law at Stanford University. Many of them, I think, have a broader view of gun rights than perhaps the NRA. They think that, uh, a good strategy is to soften public resistance to gun possession by showing a friendlier face of gun possession. A face that's younger and for whom the gun rights movement is tied to free expression. A face that is, as Weisberg put it, kind of hipper, frankly. But hip is not what comes to mind for gun control advocates. These guns that they're strutting around with, they're not protest signs, they're not toys. They are lethal weapons. Karen Artson is California coordinator for the Brady Campaign to End Gun Violence. She's picketed meetups at local Starbucks. Just because you have a right to do something doesn't mean that it's the right thing to do. We believe that taking a gun into a, a public place is putting other people at risk. You know, when your right to carry a gun comes up against my right not to get accidentally shot by you, then that's a clash of rights. Don't do it in a way that puts life at risk. A clash that's gotten the attention of Lori Saldana, a Democratic state assemblywoman who recently proposed legislation to ban open carry. What I'm concerned about is people who have no training, no accountability, 
displaying weapons publicly for no other purpose than to make some type of a, a public statement at a time when we are and fewer have fewer resources for law enforcement. While there haven't been any violent incidents involving open carry in California, local police say it's made their jobs harder. We've got to make contact with individuals that are uh, carrying a firearm. And there's no nice way of doing it. It's an officer safety problem. And then uh, once we do uh, determine that the firearm is not or, or that the individual is not in violation of the law, uh, it's tough because our investigation ends there. Current law allows police to check that openly carried guns are unloaded, but officers cannot require carriers to show ID, and they can't run the gun serial number to confirm that it's been legally purchased. Those things need to be cleared up for the benefit of the officer and the safety, for the benefit of the education of the community, and for the benefit of the rights that individuals have to carry arms. Back in Berkeley, few people seem to notice our guns. Most of the encounters we did have went smoothly. Uh, we're part of Bay Area Open Carrying, well at least I am. Uh, we advocate the open carrying, lawful open carrying of firearms. All right, thanks. Sure. But at the end of our walk, we had a very different kind of interaction. Is this like some kind of stunt? For, actually, we're uh, part of Bay Area Open Carry. We advocate the open carrying of firearms for self-defense and safety. You're actually in Berkeley? Get the out of here. I mean, what are you doing here? It's like this is like, you come here just to like cross the line in the sand or say, we don't want you, we don't want people wearing firearms on Telegraph Avenue. I'll just let you know that. You're not welcome here with your firearms. And you're entitled to your opinion. Yeah, I am. Let them know what you think, right here. Open carry has changed where we see guns and on whom. You want to do, do that for you? Now the question is, will it change how we see them? In India, the Alfonso is known as the king of mangoes, a fruit regarded as so delicious it's worthy of an overseas pilgrimage. So this is me in Berkeley Bowl. I'm looking for the world's most delicious mango, the Alfonso. It comes from India, where it's known as the king of mangoes. So much fruit here. I mean, we got some small manila mangoes. These are from Mexico. There's some green cooking mangoes here from Puerto Rico. More mangoes here, also from Mexico. Sorry, we do not carry irradiated Indian mangoes. Here I am in Berkeley Bowl, totally overwhelmed by choices, generally speaking, but the famous Alfonso I've heard so much about, I can't find here. I guess I'll have to go to India to find one. Here's Crawford Market, and this is my first stop in India. It's kind of like the Berkeley Bowl of Mumbai. There's something like 500 kinds of mangoes sold in India, but there's only one king, the Alfonso. Rich to the poor, or to the middle class, to the higher class people, everybody loves to eat the Alfonso mangoes. The king of mangoes is royally expensive. In Mumbai's markets, you can get one for about 50 rupees, that's like one dollar. It's still a fraction of what you would pay in the U.S., where an exported mango can fetch as much as six dollars. If you sell it over here somewhere, 500 rupees doesn't, so it goes to Europe, you get uh, more money. Like The U.S. banned the Alfonso decades ago, fearing that it harbored pests. But in 2006, George W. Bush changed all that with an act of mango diplomacy. India said, we will take your nuclear technology, but you must take our mangoes. And so President Bush flew to India and said, Americans are looking forward to eating Indian mangoes. Fancying myself some kind of a mango diplomat, I had to try one. One. Delicious. I understand why people say creamy. It's not fibrous at all. There's some pepperiness in it, too. Like a pepper, like top notes, maybe? It was delicious, it's true. But could it be more delicious? Where's the best Alfonso from? Um, uh, from Devgat. From, from Devgat. Devgat. Yeah, in Ratnagiri. So working on this premise, that the Alfonso is most delicious, closest to where okay. it's grown, I decided to go to the source, the Konkan Coast in southern Maharashtra. This is a place where the mango is exalted in song. Mangoes are a way of life in Ratnagari. Generations of farmers have been growing the fruit here since it was brought from South Africa hundreds of years ago. More than 250 years we are growing up this mango. The Indian government wants to reinvent the Konkan Coast as India's California, a place of natural beauty and endless bounty. In an effort to turn the Alfonso into a cash crop, the government started offering subsidies to Ratnagari's farmers. 
Alfonso production is up more than 200 percent since George W. Bush's visit. After 2006, when our state government declared this area as EEZ, that is agro export zone for Alfonso, for the last three, four years we are getting more promotions and more facilities also. George W. Bush may have accepted Indian mangoes, but these farmers had to accept our regulations in return. The FDA requires that the fruit is picked before it's ripe, artificially ripened through a heating process, and then treated with radiation to rid them of these pests that we're so worried about. We are following all the measures, and so we are allowed to export. Some believe that any chemical use whatsoever ruins the fruit. Ashok Ranade, this man, is one of a precious few farmers who stay true to the age-old organic practices of farming Alfonso's. He does not export his mangoes. I follow organic practices. That's why the aroma, taste, and the keeping quality of the fruit is very good. Cow dung and cow urine play much important role in organic farming. This is cow urine. No any insect is developed in that. It is made by earthworms. You see earthworms inside. My hands are very clean. Alfonso farmers, organic and otherwise, have prospered in the Konkan for hundreds of years. Regardless of their growing methods, these farmers are threatened by current circumstances. At the same time the government was offering subsidies to Ratnagari's farmers to grow Alfonso's for export, it was greenlighting power projects in this area. Due to environmental concerns surrounding the new power projects, farmers fear that they will lose their certification to export. So they told us that if it is in periphery of that means 5 kilometers, 10 kilometers aerial distance, we are not going to give us a global gap certificate. So that is the most threatening thing we are facing now. Despite these challenges, Alfonso farmers hope the notoriety and the availability of their fruit continues to grow. I decided to eat an Alfonso here that was slated for export to the U.S. Ah, yeah. Oh, that's, that's why. That's why. That's good. I'm convinced after eating this entire plate of mangoes, there is no difference in quality or taste or deliciousness between the mangoes that you eat here and the ones that are going to the U.S., of which this is one, right? Yeah. You're right. It's the king of mangoes. It's delicious all over the world. Thanks to these gentlemen right here. Thank you. Thank you. Taxes ignited a revolution after Bostonians threw tea into the harbor. Almost 250 years later, tea parties are springing up across the country, even in San Francisco. Hey, Nancy Pelosi, descent is patriotic. Let's hear it. Descent is patriotic. Descent is patriotic. When the tea party first appeared last year, no one knew what to make of this new political phenomenon or how successful it would be. Holding a tea party to protest your government? So 18th century. But then they started to seriously dabble in political races across the country. They claim credit for Scott Brown's victory in Massachusetts. Now they've set their sights on the U.S. Senate's most liberal member, Senator Barbara Boxer of California. I am Chuck DeVore, and I am running against Barbara Boxer. Yeah! Chuck DeVore is a Republican assemblyman from Orange County. He's been called the true conservative in the race, supporting lower taxes, balanced budgets, and limited government. As well as those principles that animate individuals like Barbara Boxer. But before he can take on Boxer, he's got some formidable and traditional primary opponents the centrist former congressman Tom Campbell, and the fiery and rich former Hewlett Packard CEO Carly Fiorina. Campbell currently has a slight lead over Fiorina, leaving DeVore a distant third. But DeVore says this could be just the year for an outsider like him, just like it was for Scott Brown. Someone who uh, is not a millionaire and, and has, you know, average uh, a middle class background, uh, who has been consistent on, on principles, uh, I think this is the year for that sort of candidate. The words in the bills speak for themselves. Shame on you for this spin, Speaker Pelosi. Yeah. It's time for you to eat humble pie! Tea Party activists are primarily middle-aged, highly educated, 
wealthy white men and women who call themselves Republicans or Libertarians. But unlike conservative groups in the past, they aren't as concerned with social issues. They saw the stimulus bill pass and thought the government was getting too involved in people's lives. It's about fiscal responsibility, lower taxes, individual liberty, and free markets. Since the Tea Party movement isn't an official third party, just small groups of citizens across the country, Zelikovsky started the Bay Area Patriots, an umbrella organization for local Tea Party movements. I think to characterize it as a Republican or a non-Republican thing, it doesn't really fit. It's really people who embrace, again, those conservative principles. On average, fewer than 20 percent of the Tea Party supporters were ever politically active before 2009. So this represents an enormous influx of people who have heretofore never been engaged in the political process ever. That's something I've never seen before. It really is the economy stupid all over again, but in reverse. Tea Party activists oppose the economic bailout. They say government is too big, too intrusive. Needless to say, they're furious about health care reform. The sheer enormity of the mechanics of government helping people um, is bigger, and bigger is not better in the Tea Party world. We're seeing uh, big government being uh, used to intervene into the affairs of, of the men and women in this nation at an unprecedented rate, and it's things like that that, that motivate me. But skeptics are quick to ask, didn't the economy crash when the Republicans were in charge? I don't agree with people who say that conservatives were asleep. We weren't asleep, but what we did is we were trusting. We thought that the people who were running the Congress were working on our behalf and doing their job, and then we found out that they weren't. Republicans and Democrats alike. But comments like this one, from former Representative Tom Tancredo, are why many outsiders dismiss the movement. Mostly because I think uh, we do not have a civics literacy test before people can vote in this country. Still, Jack Tavares from Santa Clara County says neither he nor his concerns are racist or radical. So I don't think I'm, I'm uh, a radical by any stretch of the imagination. I want to be reasonable, and I want a reasonable government making sure they take, they use a common sense approach to the way they govern this country. O'Connor says that despite its sometimes outrageous members, the movement's concerns can't be dismissed. They wouldn't hate elected officials if their lives were going well, but they're not. And so they take it out on anybody who's supposed to be helping them. Assemblyman DeVore is the first to admit he has no idea how the Tea Party voice will sway the June primary. So by itself, perhaps not enough to propel someone to victory absent support from traditional quarters. But if you've got support from traditional quarters, which I believe I have, then certainly 8 to 12 percent is determinative in a three-way primary. We will not be silent. It will be a long shot for DeVore to win and an uphill battle for the Tea Party to have a significant impact on typically moderate to liberal Californians. Still, they are raising questions and pulling more people into the 2010 elections. Using surplus satellite parts and bamboo, Mark Malmberg creates solar-powered mobiles that appear to have a life of their own. My work traditionally has been very organic, kind of expressionistic in nature. The one over your shoulder is, is Pink Sky Dragonfly. It's made with black bamboo and carbon fiber. I was not at all interested in, in battery power. And uh, these have capacitors that store the energy that, that comes from the light. That was more important to me because capacitors uh, can last a lot longer than batteries can. The little guy outside, I just call the mini. He only works outside, so he stays indoors through the winter. The mobiles do seem to have personalities. 
I think one of the things is, is the timing that I give them, where they wait a while before doing things, and then they never do the same thing again. So there's an unpredictability. It's funny how quickly people relate to them in, a, in the way of being some sort of creature. And I've stood behind people looking at them thinking, oh, it's finding where the light is and it's lining up to that. It's, it's what the art is really, is, is taking that tiny little bit of information and that little bit of, of ability and focusing it in things that, that elicit a reaction in some way. The evolution of my art from static formal sculpture into pieces that, that develop their own choreographies really stems from my background in computer animation. I specialized uh, for, for a decade and a half in a type of animation called dynamics in which you use simple sets of rules like wind and gravity to simulate complex naturalistic movement. I'm using that, those concepts, but in the real world where nature provides the complex math. Uh, the pieces I'm working on now are outdoor pieces, and so I wanted to use something that was very impervious to the weather. I want something that will not completely disappear into the environment. I don't see that as being really different with the new pieces, but the material gives it a different flavor. I feel like I'm promoting solar in a very quiet, soft way that's not politicized. The pieces are tied to the rhythm of the day, and so they're more integrated with our planet in that way. They, they go to sleep you know, at night, and they wake up in the morning, and I think that it reminds people that the sun's energy is there every day for us to use. It's common knowledge that if you're born on U.S. soil, you're automatically a U.S. citizen. But citizenship is no guarantee in other parts of the world, such as Greece, where Parliament is debating the issue. The concept of citizenship, of belonging to a particular nation, comes from ancient Greece. But modern Greece is still struggling to define what it means to be a Greek citizen. Greek state is a Christian state. So all these hundreds of thousands of Muslims, they are changing how our society feels. For decades, Greece was a place that people emigrated from, escaping war and poverty. But having people from other countries come to Greece is a relatively new concept. Δηλαδή, αγαπάει πολύ τη διασπορά, αγαπάει πολύ να, να υπερηφανεύεται του Έλληνε τη διασπορά, αλλά δεν μπορεί να ανοίξει λίγο παραπέρα τη σκέψη του να αφήσει και του άλλου να χαίρονται από τη διασπορά του. Immigrants make up 10% of Greece's population. More than half are Albanians, like journalist Niko Ago, who came after the collapse of communism in 1991. Εγώ φοιτητή. Και η μόνη διέξοδο τότε ήταν να φύγει από τη χώρα. Και ήρθα στην Ελλάδα κάνοντα 8 μέρε με τα πόδια. Η Μανουέλα Ραπούση και η οικογένεια τη came from Albania when she was 8 years old. She grew up on the Greek island of Χίο. Είναι πάρα πολύ ωραίο νησί. Είναι όμω κλειστή κοινωνία. At school, η Μανουέλα learned traditional Greek dances. But when the time came for her class to perform them on national holidays, she wasn't allowed to participate because she wasn't Greek. Εκεί έρχεσα να νιώθω ότι εγώ είμαι κάτι διαφορετικό από αυτούς. Όταν τα έκανα όλα μαζί τους και ξαφνικά διαφοροποιούμουν και επειδή ήμουν ένα παιδάκι αυτό σου χτυπάει. At this year's Independence Day parade, a journalist with a cell phone caught Greek special forces marching to an openly racist chant. For many Greeks, ethnicity and citizenship are one. Richardo Sakanzim was born in Athens. 
after high school, he wanted to join the army. But he didn't have a Greek identity card. Το θέμα είναι να προσπαθείς κάτι και να κοπείς επειδή δεν κάνεις, όχι να κοπείς επειδή για ένα χαρτί. He fought Greek bureaucracy for 10 years before he received his card, but his success was an exception. It was a kind of uh, keeping them of, in a situation of social hostage, but not allowing them to have a wider uh, temporal horizon for their being able to uh, make life plans. Until now. In March, Greece's new government signed a controversial law that makes it easier for non-ethnic Greeks to become citizens. It's directed at second-generation children who are born in Greece and have attended Greek schools for at least six years. Their parents must also be legal residents. It's based on an idea of the nation, not as something which is based on blood or uh, descendants, but on abiding by one's democratic but many are critical of the law. Some believe it's too strict, while others find it too easy. What we say is close our borders uh, from the immigrants that are here many years and they are now legalized, find ways how many we will keep them in Greece and how many we will give them even money or other things they would need to go back to their countries. And for the illegal Im immigrants, the people that came without asking us, they have to go back to their countries. <laughs> Και κάτι έγινε σε αυτή τη χώρα για αυτού του ανθρώπου. Αυτό είναι το ενθαρρυντικό. Είναι ένα σχέδιο που κάνει ένα βήμα μπρο και δύο βήματα πίσω. Εμένα με καλύπτει. Τα άλλα δύο αδέρφια δεν τα καλύπτει. Άρα, εγώ σε αυτή τη φάση δεν ξέρω πώ να αισθανθώ. Αν ήταν χαρά μου ή αν είναι λύπη μου. Η law will do little to help Greece's newest immigrants. In the aftermath of the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, a quarter of a million refugees flooded into Greece, crossing its long and porous border. Polls show that anti-immigrant sentiment has increased in the past two years. Hate crimes have occurred throughout the country. In November, a group of about 50 masked men attacked two Arab mini-markets in the Athens neighborhood of Neos Cosmos, where Greeks and immigrants live side by side. Ayman al Ahmad, a construction worker who came from Syria six years ago, showed me where it happened. Και τα παιδιά ξαναπληρώσαν και έβαλαν. Και έρεξαν δύο βόμβε στην πρώτη λάμψη εδώ. Και μόλι το. Είναι ανοιγμένοι κεφάλι, ένα σπα... σπασμένοι χέρι, ο άλλο σπασμένοι πόδι. Α, και μπήκαν οι αβοκάδε. Αυτό όταν κατέβηκε. When the police came, they arrested a few people, including one of the Arab shop owners. But the culprits were never caught. The police declined our request for an interview. The vast majority of, of the residents, of Greek residents, condemns the attack. There is a minority, but there is. Let's say is afraid of uh, of immigrants. To win over that minority, neighbors in Neos Cosmos held an Arab and Greek night and shared each other's cultures. When I went to the Independence Day celebrations in my own neighborhood, it seemed that many Greeks there accept the idea that citizenship doesn't have to be strictly a matter of heritage. Έρχεται ένας άνθρωπος και λιποθυμάει στο κατόφλι και είναι πεινασμένος, ταλαιπωρημένος, άϊπνος, δαρμένος, θαλασσοδαρμένος. Με συγχωρείτε, παιδιά, τι θα τον κάνεις αυτόν τον άνθρωπο. Δεν θα του δώσεις ένα κομμάτι ψωμί μέχρι να συνέλθει. Εγώ θέλω να τους κάνουμε για αυτούς όλους οι Έλληνες. Αυτός είναι η θέση μου. Να γίνουν και αυτοί οι Έλληνες, να γίνουν ορθόδοξοι χριστιανοί, να αγαπάνε τον Θεό όπως και εμείς εδώ. Αυτό το πράγμα κάνουμε. Religious conversion probably wasn't what the lawmakers had in mind. Κατακόκκινες φράουλες, φράσκες φράουλες. And while the new law creates an easier path for certain people to become citizens, there are many residents who will continue to live in legal limbo. Θα συνεχίσω να παλεύω για να διεκδικήσουν όλα τα παιδιά την ειδική και όλοι οι μετανάστες να έχουν δικαιώματα.